Okay, we are very blessed this evening to have with us Paris Afton Bonds, one of the nation's preeminent romance authors who has been uh, now writing for what, 20, 30, 25, 30 years, Paris? I've been a paid professional for 52 years. I keep forgetting you're that old. <laughs> My body doesn't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, do you want to turn your camera on? Uh, tell me how. I'm, okay. I uh, go to the bottom of the screen there where it has all those icons. And then yeah. go over to the left. And you should see the video camera. Just click on it. Did that do it? No. No? Did you see the little video camera? No, I don't. Oh, dear. Um, um, on my taskbar, going to the left. Uh, you know where the microphone is on the bottom left of your screen? It, it's right next to the microphone. Oh, here we go. Here there we go. Hey, what, I was looking at. Well, there Hello. you are. Hello, lady. Hello. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Okay. Am so, I good to go? I <laughs> so I'm sitting on it. I sit on an exercise ball. So get with it. I, I bounce everywhere here when I'm working. Um, yeah. Truly, thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me, and especially Southwest Riders. It's so dear to me. And Rose, you are the heartbeat of Southwest Riders. Thank oh, you. Oh, no. And I have way too many other people that do so much in this group. Oh, I, um, I, I I just talk more than them. <laughs> the whole Southwest Writers staff, but uh, especially tonight, I want to thank Dan. Um, he is the brain. He is the technologist. And I want to apologize to him because my brain short-circuited. I was on West Coast time, so I've been here about three hours. And this is despite Dan's perfect instructions to me. So better, Dan, I apologize. Better early than late, and the check's in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, then. Uh, also, as I go along, I really want to invite all of you to uh, chime in if you have comments or suggestions, because you write romances, most of you, and you, you know as well as I um, what is important to you, what you want to know, what you want to share with me that I don't know, and I don't know a lot. So um, the topic is then and now. I go way back then. Um, I wrote my first novel when I was about six and my mom saved it. It was a three page, uh, there we go, a three page novel called The Black Hawk Girls Strike Again, and I actually uh, henpecked it on a Remington typewriter. And I, I have always written, but in 1970, uh, my family, we, we moved to Mexico, and I thought, I have more time to write. So I started writing articles and short stories, and that's when I started getting paid. Um, first book was, uh, first article was for a modern secretary, and I interviewed a, a secretary at the American Embassy, and I loved it because I got frisked down by this handsome Marine uh, in order to enter the embassy there. But I got paid a whole eighty dollars, and since then, um, fifty-two years later, and actually I'm on my fifty-second novel later, so I'm here. All right, topic then and now, so. First, um, if we want to go to the next slide, definition of a romance, and this just came out of the dictionary, one which focuses on a relationship and romantic love with two people. There's also the RWA definition, and I'll read that to you. It's the main plot that revolves around two people as they develop romantic love for each other and work to build a relationship together. There's also another definition which is very simplified and I love it, but it takes us back in time to then and 
I will have to go back to the founding of RWA to finish up with that definition, which I think is perfect. So I had sold my first novel, um, let's see, it was back in 1976. It didn't get published until 78, and I was invited to speak to, ironically, the Southwest Writers Conference in Houston, Texas, at the University of Houston. And I met a wonderful woman who has been my friend over all these years. Her name is Rita Clay Estrada. She had not sold, but we started talking and we just had such a good time together. And so the next year I spoke again at the uh, Southwest Writers Conference in Houston. And afterwards, it was, romance was really starting to um, gain attention. And there were a lot of uh, romance writers there. And in my hotel room, a lot of us met um, afterwards at the end of the evening. And of course we had margaritas, but we had a great time. And um, Rita had never sold. Sandra Brown was there. She had yet to sell. Who else was there was uh, Peggy Cleves, who is Ann Majors, Sandra Stanford, who is one of the first two American writers for Harlequin. And Rita says, you know, they've got Western writers of America. We've got the mystery writers of America. Why not uh, romance writers of America? And it just seemed like a good time um, to go ahead and get this started, but I did not want to do this. My career was just starting out and I really did not want to get involved in this. I wanted to concentrate on my career, but Rita, she's, well, she is a fantastic, persuasive person. She just has such energy. And she said, come on Paris, you can do this. So uh, we met. Uh, we went ahead and said, let's do this. And we had a charter meeting at the San Jacinto Savings and Loan in Spring, Texas in 79. And I might be off a few uh, charter members here, but between 55 to 65, I think it's actually 67 who showed up. And I want to remind you, this is the start of RWA with this charter membership meeting. It was for writers, no editors, no agents were allowed. And I just cannot emphasize enough that Rita was the one who galvanized all of this. So we said, okay, we need to have a conference. <laughs> so we planned a conference for 1980 and we didn't know what we were doing at all. And um, we started scouting out motels and I lived in Houston, I, uh, Dallas. I had to drive down there to Houston and, um, let's see who else there were quite a few but Sandra said Stanford was involved for sure in that and Peggy Cleves Rita Gallagher which was Rita Clay's mother and we said this was money coming out of our pocketbooks and we said should we plan for maybe 50 people you know for a conference room and reserve the hotel rooms and um uh, we thought about it for a while and we said, ooh, let's suck it up and go for 75. And um, we were really afraid that we wouldn't get that number. We finally ended up um, against all, all of our better judgment of reserving at the beginning for 150 members uh, to attend. Well, <laughs> over 800 people showed up for that first conference of RWA. And I, uh, there was BBC, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, New York Times, Washington Post. And when we were having to get our family, I also went back and forth between the Woodlands and the um, George Bush Airport just to bring, pick up editors, agents. Everybody was wanting to come, the news media. So um, Nightline, wanted to do a one hour feature and if you will get through this later but up until then romance was um, looked on 
not a kind eye. And um, we were really worried about how news, uh, Nightline would treat us, to treat us, and they wanted a speaker for us. And it would have been crossing lines for any of us to volunteer. But Janet Daly was also a member, and so she was going to be the keynote speaker there for Nightline whole hour and we all gathered around the TV and just shaking in our boots. Would they demolish her? Would they set her up? And not only were they so kind, I mean, just, and I can't remember the man who did the interview, Hugh somebody, but Janet Daly was fantastic. She handled herself well. She spoke well. Um, she didn't get nervous like I do. I'll tell you right now. And at the end of it, we were all going, Phew. so I'm coming back around now to Janet Daly was asked, what is your definition of a romance novel? And this is it. It's about the main character either talking to the beloved, talking about the beloved, or thinking about the beloved. And you cram that into a novel and you've got readers. So uh, let's go on to slide two. There we go. So I cut my teeth on historical romances. Actually, I, my first love romances was a comic book. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember Archie and Veronica and Reggie and Jughead. But loved those as a child. But my parents... And they were very middle, middle class parents. But I remember them having uh, two bookshelves of hardbacks. And they they were almost all that I read were historical writers. And they did have romance in them. And these are some of the writers I remember reading. Frank Yerby was uh, the Golden Hawk. Within the first page, he was talking about um, romance. Samuel Schellerberger, I think that was Captain from Berger, Captain from Castile. Raphael Sabatini was Captain Blood, Dill Van Every, Bridal Journey, and uh, Sir Walter Scott Ivanhoe. So this is what I cut my teeth on and why um, almost all, well, a great deal of my 52 novels are historical romances. So let me ask you, do any of y'all want to suggest there are any do any of y'all are old enough to even read that far back? Since I can't hear anyone, does that mean no one's responding? I read Ivanhoe many years ago. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, um, so did I. Go, go ahead. I said so did I. As a kid. As a kid, yes. As a kid. Um, and I, so I remember seeing the movie with Robert Taylor, I think. I, I read it during su I read it during summer vacation. Did you get caught up in the romance of it? Yeah, yeah. I did, but I don't think I was old enough to fully understand all of it. <laughs> all of the yeah. But but it's a well, fun it's a fun memory. Pardon me? It's a fun memory having read it during yeah, summer vacation. I don't think I understood all of these either because uh, that I've got listed here, but they got me started. So uh, if we could go to the next uh, slide, please. From there, I branched out to early romance writers, and these are just some of them that came to my mind when I was planning this. Georgia, um, I'll be skipping around here. I'm going to go by time-wise. Georgia Heyer actually wrote The Black Moth in 1921. And I read that. It was uh, featured on a giveaway on Amazon just recently, you know, like for, um, an e-book for $1.99. And it, it was really good. Next was um, Barbara Cortland. She wrote Jigsaw. And she actually, that was banned by the prime minister in England because um, they called it risque and it was more of a society, society thriller. This was in 1923. 
Daphne Diamore, Rebecca. I want to back up um, to Georgette Hiram, Barbara Cartland when I was doing my research. Barbara Cartland actually lifted quite a bit of her material from Georgette Hiram. And the publishing house wanted to sue Barbara Cartland. And uh, Georgette Hiram refused to. But I will say, uh, Barbara Cartland went on to write over 100 romance novels. Daphne du Maurier, Rebecca, did anyone read Rebecca? Remember that one? That was 1938. Um, Phyllis Whitney, she always wanted to emphasize that her genre was romantic suspense. Jan Westcott, oh my gosh, The Border Lord and The Hepburn, I loved, loved that. I want to talk a little bit here about Kathleen Windsor. Do you, any of you remember what she wrote? It was made into a movie and famous. She wrote Forever Amber. It got banned here in America in 14 states. And back at that time, Ava Gardner was married to Artie Shaw. And in one of the gossip columns, Hedda Harper or something, they interviewed Artie and he criticized her, lambasted her for reading a trashy novel. Which brings me to the very last one, Grace Metalis. She, let's see how many, I'm trying to see how many states that she got banned in, but she was lambasted as well for her novels being lurid, dirty, slut, trashy, all of the above. And what happened here is for the first time, it was blatant. She addressed what we did not talk about in public, um, rape incest, abortion, promiscuity. Of course, it was a bestseller. Anyone want to address any of the early romance novels that they might have read that I missed here? No one? Help me. <laughs> All right, move, move along to the next one. The next slide, please. So in the 70s, the romance novels hit their stride with uh, Kathleen Woodwiz. Her novel came out in 1972. Uh, let's see, 74 was Janet Daly and Sandra Stanford. And I wanna um, pause here on Mills and Boone. My gosh, the British were way, known to be uptight, nostalgic. They were way ahead of the United States here. Mills and Boone started publishing romance novels in 1908. Um, I did want to mention here that on Janet Daly, I remember reading on her, she had sent her book into Harlequin, which was a Canadian offshoot of Mills and Boone, and they made her send it to Mills and Boone uh, in order for her novel to be bought. First American Harlequin fighter. Let's see. Uh, book covers. I wanted to address that for a second. And also back to Grace of Metallius, all the trashy novels. Back then, I don't know if any of you remember, but we had we had made our own book covers or you could buy them of cloth. And that way you couldn't get shamed for reading a romance. Uh, next slide, please. So who reads romance? And I guess it's on the next slide. Oh, there it is. 82% are women, 45 have college degrees, and the average age is 42. But romance readers are getting younger. And this is great for us because it's expanding uh, our market. And this is just one of the um, surveys I saw, but it seemed to fit in with the general consensus. That's a redundant. It seemed to fit in with the consensus. All right, and I want to talk about getting younger. We have the Hunger Games that have been very popular. Of course, Harry uh, Potter and Colleen Hoover, who writes the new adults. So this a big market there. Next, please. All right, these are the highest grossing. And there were several surveys, but these seem to generally 
crop up in these surveys. Um, and look at the uh, young ones, Twilight's in there. It ends with us, Colleen Hoover, Pride and Prejudice, Diane Gobbledon, and of course, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Anyone read that one? Confess. No one's saying anything about I read it, I'm going to tell you. I read it, but I thought it was rather boring. Um, but maybe that good, tells you good, more about me input. than anything else. Um, I I agree with you on that, but do you? She certainly hit a market there. She did. Yeah. Um, let's see. If that's all I wanted to say on that. Oh, I also wanted to mention. Let's see. No, I think go on if you don't mind to the next slide. Well, I missed one here. Uh. I'll just bring it up and maybe we'll come across that slide. Uh, I wanted to mention that the all of the published fiction books, all of them, and that includes Christian romances, Western romances. Um, it can include uh, sci-fi, fantasy, Westerns, mysteries, thrillers, all of the uh, fiction books published. Do you know that one third of them are romances. Romances count for one billion dollars a year. And they were once called pulp fiction. All right, so here's the uh, a slide here that just briefly touches on the elements, the themes of love. I oh, can't stand this anymore. Pardon me? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yay! Okay. The Themes of Love, extended prose fiction with a central focus on the development of a romantic relationship between two people. Love is the driving force. They're supposed, expected to be optimistic and aspirational. They provide an escape from reality and offer hope. And Readers, um, what does that say? Can improve them. I can't read the other word in the lose themselves. I would imagine the possibility of finding true love and happily ever after. Keep in mind that happily ever after for a moment. So, happy endings. All romance novels follow a moral principle good behavior is rewarded, is rewarded with unconditional and could be love. There, so. In the romances, you're going to find the conflict and overcoming challenges. I'm going to sort of move on to the emotional through line here. They evoke strong emotions. They're, if you've got a good romance, you're going to cry and laugh and get angry. They take readers on an emotional roller coaster here. In my, when I've, every one of my novels, Plotting comes first rather than characterization. Because I think only in tight, tense, hot plotting can you force the character to expose what they're all about. They can't control themselves anymore. And then that way you can develop the character through the plotting. That's how I feel. But uh, you see the emotions then under stress. And I just finished reading a series called um, The Bronze Horseman. My gosh, um, first book was over 500 pages, second book over 500, third book over 700. And I wept and I got angry and uh, just laughed. It was really a great, full of packed emotion. Took place in Russia. It was started out in with the siege of Leningrad during the World, World War II, moved to America and the Cold War, and then the third book ending up with dealing with just ordinary life. And can, maybe I should ask y'all, can a grand love, which this couple had uh, in the book, can it survive ordinariness, do you think, in romances? No suggestions? 
All right, then. Uh, I know we, uh, back to uh, historical roots. Several of the, uh, a lot of books are coming out now and films that all are returning to um, historical romances. We've got Bridgerton. Um, of course, Game of Thrones is not, I don't know why I have that listed. Outlander, uh, Downington Abbey. So historical romances, I think they'll always be in. Now, back to the, uh, or, I'm sorry, the next slide, please. So happy ever after or not. In the previous slide, readers read for a happy ending. But I think it's the ones that are not necessarily so that we keep in mind, we remember forever. Oh, I have someone here saying, I love Romeo and Juliet. Um, I loved all of these. Um, the Gone with the Wind. All of these novels have a, an ending that is satisfactory in my mind to what the story is about. And even in Gone with the Wind, um, Scarlett says, well, tomorrow is another day, so maybe she'll change on that next day. Most of my novels have had happy endings. I did write one, and I uh, had moved to Albuquerque to write this novel. It's set in Taos. Uh, it took me about two years, and it's called When the Heart is Right, and it did not have the uh, happy ever after ending. It was about a... Uh, the wife of a, took place in the 1930s, the wife of a politician, and she goes to Taos to recover from uh, tuberculosis. It's either that or die. And, of course, she falls in love with a, um, a started to say, what was it, was it Navajo? In a Taos shaman. Um, I can't even think of the tribe now. I apologize. And in the end, the, and this is based on fact, the Taos Indians are fighting to regain their sacred blue lake from our um, government, the Secretary of Interior. And it, it was corrupt and they lost so much of their land, but she dies in this ending. And yet I left it open, uh, the Indian shaman who tried to heal her, he was also a soul traveler. So in the end he says, I come, I come, I come for you. So we think that, I'm hoping that they see something worth in that. Next one. So here is the juxtaposition I find interesting. The first romance novel sold in regular bookstores, and this was in England, the historical pattern, uh, I'm sorry, Pamela Virtue Rewarded, published in 1740, written by a male, uh, Samuel Richardson. And there we have the virtue and virginity and everything celebrated there. And then we moved to Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, we moved to L to Twist Me and LGBTQT romances. And uh, I have to just laud that, that we've able to come so far that we take away um, the shame that's involved in reading any kind of romance. Uh, Sex is a life-giving force, and yet for so long, um, women, for three, over 3,000 years, we've been chateau, we've been to property, we've, we would be shameful for us to enjoy sex. So I think in the 70s, that probably explains um, the body strippers that involved the shakes, the pirates, the vampires, um, because that way we were able to enjoy sex since we didn't initiate it. Anyone want to speak up on that? I need your help here, y'all. <laughs> Come on. All right. Uh, yeah. What, what is what is twist me? Twist me um, is a um, erotica, erotic romance. Uh, it's along the lines of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. I remember uh, another lady, you'll remember Sarah Baker, who used to be president of this group and who wrote both romance and erotica. And I remember one time I asked her, because I didn't know, what was the difference between 
between erotica, you know, and, you know, or not pornography. or romance or whatever. And her answer was that erotica was pornography written for women. That's fine. I love it. <laughs> Yay. Whatever. Okay. We should be um, allowed to read without being shamed. Whatever genre it is, I feel like. Uh, and I was going to mention this later, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead now while it's on my mind. Early on in the 70s, um, there were quite a few writers who started out mainly in California, which was the, the center of the publishing industry was in New York, but the secondary was in California, and a lot of pornography came out of there, and a lot of people got their start learning how to write, because you really have to know how to set a story and a plot line and keep it tense, and yet you're having sex, 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 sex. And one of them was Dean Kuntz, and uh, he talks about how that taught him to write. All right, anything else, and we'll, or we'll move on? All right, next, uh, please. So here is a quote by a bookstore owner in Kentucky, which she's five years ago, she set up in a very small area, a, a bookstore for romance books only. And uh, she leased it and she just was worried about it doing well. Well, it did so well, she had to expand it. But um, here is this quote, Gen Z, they're more open. They're bolder. They're more willing to be vulnerable. I think it's giving us millennials and all of those baby boomers that love romance more permission to love the things, these things out loud. Um, and her name is Scrobum, the Kentucky bookstore owner. I think we're undoing generations of guilt and shame. Booksellers say a new generation of romance fans is driving, I don't know what, the change in the public perception of romance, a genre that was once greeted with sneering and leering. So uh, let me see if that's all I wanted to say on that one. Uh, yeah, go ahead if you don't mind, please, the next slide. Ah, uh, look at that on, uh, cover there. So we're, I'm gonna get more into the nuts and bolts here, but while we're talking about the covers of romances, there's a Facebook book group called I Love Bodice Rippers, and you need to really visit it. It's they post, and most of um, I would say eighty percent is just about the covers. Occasionally they'll comment, but I don't think I can remember seeing a negative comment on the content even. But the covers, they're the vintage covers, and these ladies are going out and men um, driving 40, 50 miles to find a romance cover they've been looking for a bodice ripper and um, spending big bucks sometimes, you know, up to $75. So you might want to check that out. But as far as covers on the books that have been my, uh, the books that I've self-published, indie published, I've used 5RR and done very well with them. Core graphics, um, the lady is out of uh, Italy that does that fabulous work. EDH graphics, usually, if, um, I don't know what they charge now, but within the last year or two, they were charging $100 about for cover. Also, you can get your images to submit at Romance Novel uh, Center, CanStock, um, iStock, Shutterstock, I think, which is interesting. I think they just recently, I may be wrong, went out of business um, because they simply couldn't make money. People could use now the AI, uh, AI and do just as well. All right, the next one, please. As far as formatting apps, I've always used Microsoft Word because I'm an old fogey and it's hard for me to learn new things. Um, I did use Vellum once, uh, Scrivener, draft to di digital and Reezy, I believe Reezy, Reezy is free. I pay currently $69 a year 
But when I went online, I saw where Microsoft is uh, 149. So I don't know on that, but you might want to keep these in mind. And on the nuts and bolts, let's go to the next one, please. There we go. So on the editors, I want to talk about Kate Duffy, and it really relates back to how I got started. I um, wrote the novel. I start with, I'll go ahead and say the title because it was changed, Corrida, and I sent it in over the transom. And back then, over the transom meant um, you just sent it blindly to a publishing house, no one in particular. And Kate Duffy um, got a hold of the novel, and apparently, she probably leafed through three or four pages and said, oh, this might be interesting. I'm going to pause here and tell you, I just cringe at that novel. I cannot believe I wrote it so badly, but she must have seen something in me. But what the editors did back then, they had readers. And let's say uh, your novel was about horses or chess, for instance, like The Queen's Gambit. They would send out the novel to reader, and I think the readers read it for free, I'm not sure. And the readers would report back. Then the uh, editor would read it. And if she liked it, she would meet, they would have meetings going on throughout the week. And she would meet with the, um, the editorial staff and the editor in chief there. And she would pitch why she, this story has to be published. This is such a, a good story. And a decision was made then uh, whether to take it or not. And then she'd have to go back also. There would be meetings on the covers, what would be dis decided. Would the book be a mid-list or would it be a mainstream? Uh, and mine were mid-list starting out. Uh, the marketing, they would meet with um, the marketing and they would deal with sales. So that's how uh, on sales, Corita got changed to Sweet Golden Sun. Rosemary Rogers had just published a book, uh, Sweet Savage Love. So I'm thinking that the editorial staff sort of took off on that because uh, Rosemary Rogers' book was booming. I wanted to touch on, oh, I remember I went up to visit Kate Duffy, by the way, uh, in New York. And I remember seeing her, the windowsill being stacked with manuscripts and there are manuscripts on the floor. I just don't know how they did it. But to submit a manuscript back then, you submitted a cover letter and you told what the book was about briefly and if you had any credits. And you didn't need it. They weren't, there weren't editors. That's what editors are for. They work for publishing houses. So you didn't have to, like you do now, if you're going to um, get a, uh, a book uh, submitted, you, you have to have an editor. So moving uh, oh, I, one more thing on Kate Duffy. Phenomenal. She, I This popular library where she worked when she hired me uh, or bought my first book. And um, and I'll go ahead and tell you now, it was bought for up front. Um, and at this time in the 70s, for me being poor, it was all money. It was 6000 And you get $3,000 up front because they love you. <laughs> and then you get $3,000 when um, you submit the book, you get three thousand on signing the contract, three thousand um, on submission of the book. And I remember Kate telling me that she would much rather have a hack writer because they know how to produce and they can be depended on. And they every year they can try out two or three books, then a bestseller, one-time bestseller. Also, she told me back then that they're not going to make any money on my book. They say no books, rarely do they make money on the first or second. It's usually the third before they start seeing the money. And she went on to become an icon of the industry. There's a Kate Duffy Foundation. And she did pass away uh, not too long ago. So editorial services, you can find them online. Uh, word of mouth is important on this. Um, I use Jake Mullins. I love him. Um, First, because financially, he's very uh, willing to work with me. Uh, 
also because he just doesn't necessarily catch my grammatical errors or my typos, my spelling mistakes. But being a male, he'll sometimes tell me from a male point of view, yeah, Paris, I don't know if a male would react that way or, or use that speech. And he's also for me weapons and he just all, I cannot talk enough about the content he even reviews or edits. So uh, let me see if I've left anything out there. Um, okay, go along to the next one. <laughs> so I wanted, I don't see it coming up and I might be out of order. Uh, it's agents, contracts, and royalties. But before we uh, get to that, I wanted to mention that, uh, no, I am in order here. Um, back in the 70s, there were two major uh, books that a writer could go to, and they were called Writer's Market and Marketplace, and there were tomes, and every year they would be updated. But you could find, if you wrote for magazines, you could find who was the editor of the magazine, the address for the submission, what they were looking for. You could find uh, agents who would be listed there, their, you know, address, and even phone numbers that um, I remember finding the phone number for a uh, popular library there, although I had submitted it blindly. Uh, but that now Google takes care of all that. So, sweet gone son, I've talked to you a little bit about how that got started. That was the first cover. And then I wanted to talk to you uh, about Deep Purple because it's about contracts. Oh, I guess I can mention agents. I apologize for that, neglected. What can I say about agents? Basically, um, it's always been a catch-22, but more so back then. It's hard to get an agent unless you've been published. And it's hard to get published unless you have an agent. But who I forget who was speaking up earlier about not having the wherewithal to continue and you get down. Believe me, if you just stay persistent, don't uh, don't listen to that voice that tells you uh, you can't do this, um, and you will sell. So deep purple. This is on contract. I talked on contracts. Um, they, they had paid me, um, who was this? I think it was Harper Collins, I think, or Valentine, I, Fawcett, maybe it was Fawcett, the upfront money and wanting me to produce this historical novel. And I'm six months through it and it sucks. It is so bad. And I'm in tears. I don't think how I can go on and my career is ruined. It's over with. We lived on a small ranch, and um, out back we had a 55-gallon drum that we burned our trash in. And back then, there weren't computers, so you typed everything, and you had onion skin, you had um, the actual the pepper you typed it on. I was ready to go and take um, Deep Purple, the first or second draft, and just put it in the trash and burn it. It was just... I, I can't tell you how down I was, but I had their money, so I had to produce something. <sighs> so I finished up the novel, sent it in, and Deep Purple went on to become uh, a New York Times bestseller. So what do I know? What do any of us? Don't let your opinion stand in the way. Write the book, finish it, do your best. Royalties. Um, back then, um, they were 8, 10, 12 percent, sometimes going up to 15. That's all I can tell you about back then. Now, um, I'm seeing 60, 40, 50, 50. I sort of miss the old days. Next, uh, please. Before I mention this, would anyone speak up and say, do you prefer print over ebook? I had that as a question. Does anyone prefer the prints? Print. 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 Yeah, I prefer print, print but I, I read yeah. my Kindle all the time because I can haul it anywhere. Okay. 
I like all three forms. I like print, auto, auto, uh, audible, audio, audible, and yeah. e-books. Good, a uh, good point here. All right. Yeah, me too. Who said I didn't hear? All three. I like all three also. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a benefit. You know, uh, we've come a long way to audio. I'm so glad you brought that up. I neglected that. Uh, this is really toward the end of what I wanted to talk about. Sexily Ever After. How Romance Bookstores Took Over America. And this was published, if you'll look below, and if you can go to this link, it is so well worth uh, reading by The Guardian, of course, out of Great Britain. And it was published on Valentine's Day. But five years ago, there was that one bookstore I told you about that was specializing in romance. There are now 15, um, at least, and also one in Canada. So there is just the encouragement that romance is expanding big time. People drive hours to these bookstores. I, mean, I don't know if I'm repeating myself, but one of the bookstores said that um, they had someone actually flying on a private fl plane. And I think it was a West Virginia bookstore. Um, they flew in from, I can't remember if it's Pennsylvania or Connecticut. So that tells you just how strong the romance industry is. What was there was something else I was going to mention on that? that I, oh, the titles. Look at the titles. Aren't they wonderful? Um, Wanderlust, Brush Bookstore, Under the Covers. Um, I can't see the rest on that. Now, let's see what else do I wanted to talk about. I also wanted to mention about marketing. And the, the one of the and out of this uh, article, the woman said we did when we set up our bookstore, we did not spend one dollar in promoting and marketing. She said it was all done on, and she said TikTok was the foremost, but all done in the social media, um, Facebook. Uh, but she did say uh, something else. It's always word of mouth. All right, so wrapping up here um, for the next one slide, please. There, oh, there I am. So I just wanted to give you the philosophy from uh, this 80 year old. Um, and what I feel is important is to pursue your passion. It's sure we all wanna be best sellers, but it's what we're doing right now in the moment that brings us the passion. And I'm telling you, when you get to this age, you, you don't want to voice it doing something that you don't love. So one, pursue your passion. Two, don't settle. Don't ever settle. Uh, if this is your passion, find a way if you have to work. And I've had to do it. I've had four jobs for five months at one time. But don't settle for anything. Uh, except for following your passion. And lastly, every, all of our heartbreaking missteps that we've made along the way over the years, I want you to know that they're only breadcrumbs for our future steps to follow to help us uh, fulfill our heart's fondest desires. So for all of you, my fondest desire for each of you is a worldwide bestseller. And I am finished. Yay. <laughs>